Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Mamola. I'm the Forest Protection Advocate with the John Muir Project. Um, thanks for coming to our second installment of our web series, Understanding the Science. Um, we're doing a deep dive on the newest, uh, most relevant science on topics such as wildfire, ecology, biology, and much more to the public in a universe, universally digestible manner. Um, and here with me today is uh, my friend and colleague, Rebecca August from the Los Padres Forest Watch, who will be my co-moderator for today's presentation. Um, over to you, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca August, Director of Advocacy at Los Padres Forest Watch, and we're an organization that protects wildlife, wilderness, water, and sustainable access throughout federal public lands on the Central Coast. And today's webinar, we're lucky enough to have four out of five authors from the new study have Western USA fire suppression and megafire active management approaches become a contemporary Sisyphus, recently published in the peer review journal, Biological Conservation. The webinar today will be split up into multiple parts with each author discussing a section of the study and responding to questions, followed by a full panel discussion and Q&A at the end of the presentation. And we ask that you submit all your questions into the chat box or by clicking the Q&A at the bot button at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar will be recorded and distributed with our, with our follow-up materials and any questions that are not answered during today's live webinar will be answered by the authors in writing in, in, and included in the follow-up materials. So hopefully you've had a chance to answer the two polling questions. One pertains to your scientific experience and background, and the second is about your personal interaction with wildfires. Again, these are um, collected anonymously, and we're just interested in this information so that we can better tailor our discussion and be respectful of your experience and potential past traumas. That being said, in today's webinar, if you um, at, do, at one point, at any point, do feel triggered by the discussion, feel free to message me or um, Jen here, the panelist, and we will do our best to accommodate um, all your requests. So with all of that out of the way, join me in welcoming, please, today's panelist, Dr. Dominic De La Sala, Chief Scientist at Wild Heritage, Mr. Luke Riediger, the Conservation Director of the Klamath Forest uh, Alliance, my colleague Bryant Baker, Conservation Director at Los Padres Forest Watch, and Dr. Do um, Dr. Chad Hansen, the Principal Forest and Fire Ecologist of the John Muir Project. And with that, uh, Dr. De La Sala, please help us understand the science. Take it away, Dom. All right, I'm going to share my screen, so you'll have to let me know uh, once you see all of this i've got to get it give me a second to get over to the presentation mode okay so you should be able to see my screen now and i've got a lot of material to cover in a very short period of time and there were three recent papers that actually came out all about the same time in peer-reviewed journals. And much of what you're seeing today is a summary of just the one article. Others will talk about some of the others. And this was also, some of it was presented at the uh, congressional hearing in the oversight committee a couple of weeks ago that myself and Carol King uh, were the chief witnesses for our community. But I think the, the Sisyphus approach is kind of hitched to this. And it's the famous quote that is attributed to Albert Einstein. You do the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome. That's insanity. And that's pretty much what is characterizing the, what, the contemporary wildfire issue in the Western US. As you can see from this figure, the Sisyphus approach is to do more of the same, expecting a different outcome, pouring billions of dollars into massive industrialized fire suppression while at the same time, the area uh, burning is going up, both the U.S. Department of Interior and the U.S. Forest Service are involved in this, uh, DI, uh, USDI mostly on the parks, which is, you know, they've got a good fire policy in place, but the Forest Service is largely in the suppression uh, camp on this uh, curve, and it's going up. Every year, we see more and more money poured into this. At the same time, we've reached a new climate abnormal, situation that has changed fire behavior. On the far left of the side slide, uh, the early part of the 1900s was a very active fire period. Uh, actually, there was more burning during that time than contemporary fires. And the big burn in 1910 is a good example of that. 
And then around the 1940s, right around World War II, there was a cool down. And you can see the, the decline in fire activity that corresponded to a ramp up in effectiveness of industrialized fire suppression. At the same time, there was, there was sprawl. Uh, homes, more and more homes were being built in unsafe places because there was this false sense of security that the Forest Service would rush in and put out all the fires. Right around 1980s, we start to see an increase in fire activity as more and more acres are, that are burning uh, in these areas affecting towns go up. At the same time, we've seen an explosion of population uh, growth in the West. But the federal agencies in particular have blindfolds on when it comes to human-caused ignitions. Everything is focused on so-called fuels and very little, if anything, is focused on human-caused ignitions. As this uh, figure shows from a paper published in 2017, most of the fire ignitions in uh, the U.S. are caused by people. And it varies depending on where you are, the, the bluer colors less so, the darker colors more so. Uh, and about 80% or so of all wildfires over this two decade period have a human component to them. And the more people you have, the more roads you have in an area, the higher the probability, that's never factored into fire issues or fire planning. And I'm just going to set up the stage for my colleagues to come next. And the contemporary fire problem is really a perfect storm. It's a collision of a lot of different things that have happened over several decades of poor fire management, beginning with historical and contemporary logging and road building that removes the most fire resistant, resilient trees and older forests. That type conversion contributed to the setup that we have now. Historical emphasis on all fire starts out by 10 a.m. the next day, the Smoky Bear policy, and that is often triggered by the Forest Service. Chief uh, Randy Moore triggered it again in last year's uh, fires because of all the political pressure. And the Forest Service tends to be bipolar on this. They talk about working with wildfire for ecosystem benefits when we're not in fire season, and then they throw everything they have at fires burning even safely in the backcountry, including in wilderness areas where they're supposed to be using so-called mist approaches, minimum impact suppression tactics. As we'll see later on, that's not working in many cases. The focus has been on an expansive wooey that can go out a mile and a half from the nearest structures. And we know the science uh, has now overtaken that, that it's all about defensible space and home hardening and not the wooey that saves homes. Post-fire salvage logging has contributed to the problem and climate change increasingly has become the top-down driver of fire behavior, the so-called mega fires. And so uh, Luke is gonna cover this, but I just wanna point it out real quickly that industrial fire suppression comes with huge costs to ecosystem resilience, it's akin to removing the apex predators in ecosystems that then unravel because of the lack of that dynamism that exists in predator prey or in ecological processes like fire. And these aren't just benign activities. They take place in national monuments like the Cascade Siskiyou in Oregon, in wilderness areas, in roadless areas, and they leave big scars on the landscape that don't come back like a fire affected uh, landscape would. And it's often done in tandem of what we're calling uh, mega fire active management approaches or MFAMA. And you'll see that in the slides that follow. So again, this is huge and the footprint has been increasing. And so here's really what mega fire active management encompasses. It's not some benign activity. It includes all kinds of things, large and small tree removal, post-fire logging, prescribed fire, which can be eco uh, ecologically benefit beneficial in the right conditions, uh, cross-laminated timber production, biomass energy burning, all uh, being cast as restoration. And you can see some of the damages here that occur on these landscapes from this, uh, this range of activities. Ecosystem shifts from forests to savannas that are weed infested. And then you introduce other disturbance factors like cattle grazing. You do post-fire logging, you've got road impacts. This is not some benign activity. It's been 
uh, discussed as such by the proponents of this and by federal agencies, but it's not. And there are cumulative ongoing ecosystem impacts that damage the resilient properties of uh, fire affected landscapes. They don't, that's not restoration. Uh, and here's some of the Orwellian terminology that we are dealing with, uh, thinning, fuel treatment, resiliency, disturbance restoration, forest health, climate smart forestry. This is a slide from some of Luke's work. You can see the blue marking on these very large dug firs to protect supposedly that 19 inch diameter pine in the center of the uh, photograph. When you're taking out fire resistant trees, you're leaving the logging slash on the ground that's gonna burn. You can't get it all in burn piles. A lot of it's left on the ground. And we've seen it being used in spotted owl habitat, uh, advocated by collaboratives, sometimes run by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the, the amount of damage in spotted owl habitat results in downgrading critical habitat. And that's a lot worse than uh, anything that spotted owl is gonna deal with in fire. And what we've done is simulated that. And our myself and my our colleagues showed that the damage from thinning in spotted owl habitat was three to six times greater than what the effects of fire would be in that habitat over time. Yet this is in the uh, spotted owl recovery plan, even though the science says otherwise, and collaboratives and groups like the Nature Conservancy continue to push this forward despite the evidence that says that fire is not a main problem for owls and thinning is. We hear all kinds of claims about how they're protecting large trees. At the same time, they uh, have lifted the uh, protection screens in the forest in Eastern Oregon and Washington, claiming that they needed to take out trees in the drip line of a uh, pine, as you've seen in the previous uh, slide, that can be really damaging. And it's these larger, larger trees that have most of the carbon, which is what that figure shows you when the trees get above about 20 inches diameter, which is where you see that dashed line, their, carbon, their rate of carbon accumulation takes off. And yet the proponents of these activities are calling for the removal of 21 inch diameter trees and replacing the standard with 150 year old age, which means bigger trees coming out of the forest that are carbon dense and fire resistant relative to the smaller trees. Um, and these kinds of activities will add more emissions to the atmosphere, contributing to the fire problem they are seeking to solve. And so when you look at the amount of emissions coming from logging to supposedly reduce fire severity, it's, uh, it, it often dwarfs that of the fire itself, as you can see from some of the statistics here. And then those products are put into things like biomass energy burning, which is as bad as coal. And yet it's marketed as clean, renewable energy. So, you know, there's the question of what do you do with the material once you thin the forest? And if it's going into biomass burning, it's burning like you're burning coal. And that's only going to contribute to the problem down the road. This problem is not exclusive to Western United States. I'm working with groups in Australia and British Columbia and other places in Canada that are dealing with this same problem, the perception that thinning is gonna reduce fires and then we can take the material and throw it into biomass burning or CLT manufacturing and somehow that's gonna be less emissions. It's not, and it only makes the problem worse. Now the, the question comes to mind, what about thinning? Can it reduce fire intensity? Well, it may under certain conditions, you'd have to put lipstick on the pig to make it look good which essentially means you got to retain all the large trees, thin from below, don't overdo your spacing, follow it prescribed fire, not pile burning, contain the flammable weeds, keep the cows off of it, close and obliterate the roads. Then you got a chance that if the fire is under low uh, and moderate uh, fire weather, you could reduce intensity, but that almost never happens. And in fact, even if it did happen, the chance of co-occurrence of when the so-called fuels are at their lowest point and a lightning bolt hitting that site is less than about a 1% probability. So you wind up putting more em emissions into the atmosphere that causes more problems to achieve a needle in a haystack approach if you do everything right. 
and that seldom happens. Perspectives also matter in this debate, and I'm constantly frustrated by hearing, well, we want more good fire on the landscape and less bad fire on the landscape, but what does that really mean? And a high severity fire is not a bad fire. And in fact, this is the kind of fire mosaic that we see in most of the Western landscapes. We refer to this as pyrodiversity. And Chad and I did a book on this. And we did a book on the mixed severity fire as nature's phoenix because it has comparable levels of biodiversity that we see in old growth forest ecosystems. But we almost always hear catastrophic language speak when we're dealing with these high severity component of these forests, which happens to be the most biodiverse place in the fire mosaic. All right, I'm getting down to my end of uh, my presentation. And I, I think in the uh, Sisyphus approach, what we really came down to was uh, saying that the all fire severities and all large trees are at historical lows. And we gotta get more fire back on the landscape in a safe way because it's pyrodiversity that begets biodiversity. You can't put the fire genie back in the bottle. Fuel treatments have limitations and, and increasing costs, and they're very limited in a, in a uh, changing climate. We need to really treat the root causes, which are more emissions from logging and fossil fuel burning, if we're really going to get a handle on this. And you know, under a high emission scenario, which is what we're in now, the world is under a high emission scenario, we're gonna see more fires regardless of what happens on the ground. And the important point here is not to make it worse. Uh, and preparing for this means surgical application, working from the home out and not the wildlands in. And you know, the uh, criticism of our work talked about paralysis caused by too many environmental regulations. If anything, it's the opposite. We are in an era of categorical exclusions, not analysis paralysis. And so that is where we pretty much uh, concluded our paper. And I'll just leave you with this slide because these are some of my two favorite uh, slides here And that. Every disaster film begins with a scientist being ignored. And I'm sure many of you have seen the, the movie Don't Look Up. It kind of feels that way when it comes to fire issues that uh, there's a strong confirmation bias and a lot of the ecological and climate literature is being ignored uh, with some false uh, solutions being proposed. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna flip the ball over to my colleague, uh, Luke Rudiger, who's really gonna drill down on a lot of these issues. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And then and before we do that, we're going to we're going to actually try and tackle a couple questions first. Um, oh, is that how you want to do it? OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Preston Ryan was asking, um, did I interpret one of the earlier graphs correct in that our climate was hotter slash drier in the 30s than it is now? No, I don't think that's the case. I do think that there was a very hot, dry spell back then. And the fact of the matter back then, there was very little uh, fire suppression. They were out there with picks and shovels, so they weren't very effective at fire suppression. Uh, and, you know, we had a lot more fire burning on, on the landscape before the advent of mechanized fire suppression. We've tried to turn that spigot off. Uh, there was a hot period back then, but uh, it didn't last as long as the trend that we're in now. Okay, thank you. Um, Daniel Rossman would like to know, with all the money available for fire treatment in the federal and state budgets this year, what projects can we put forward that take this science into account and are not at, not at worst harmful thinning or at worst ineffective fuel breaks? Yeah, you know, my biggest concern is that the Forest Service is going to be swimming in cash here because of the infrastructure law. There was even more money in Build Back Better that had been subsidizing all kinds of really bad projects. So I, you know, the, at the hearing, Chief Moore announced that they were going to log 50 million acres, 20 million of which would be on national forest in the next 10 years. And I think that, uh, you know, we really need to play a role at the table to make sure that that logging does not occur in snag forest, in old forest, and does not remove big trees, because that's going to cause the most damage in this. And the, the extent that we can, 
we need to direct uh, as much of that money into home hardening, defensible space, and doing those kinds of partnerships. And that, that logging in the back country that isn't going to protect homes and is only going to make them, the situation worse. Great. Thanks, Dom. Okay. And so now, um, just to reiterate before um, I pass it off to Luke, um, Luke will give a brief summary and then we'll do a Q&A after him and same with Bryant and same with Chad afterwards. Um, and so, yeah, Luke, if you are good to go. All right. Thanks. Uh, let me get my screen set up here. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, can people see that? Or wait. Can people see that? Okay. Uh, you need to get into presenter mode, though. Go. All right, there we are. So, um, my name is Luke Riediger. Um, I live on the Oregon California border in the Siskiyou Mountains, and I work for two environmental organizations. Uh, that work to protect the forests and biodiversity of the Klamath Siskiyou region. So that's Applegate Neighborhood Network. Uh, I'm the executive director and also the conservation director for the Klamath Forest Alliance. So for both organizations, I incorporate on the ground monitoring into my advocacy work and work to document the current, uh, the impacts of the current uh, megafire active management approach on public lands. Um, this approach is often described as benign or even beneficial but it has many impacts and these impacts are steadily increasing as we implement more aggressive fire suppression activities and more aggressive and widespread forest management. Um, I also run the Klamath Siskiyou Fire Reports Program for the Klamath Forest Alliance. And over the past 10 years, we have published 13 reports on wildfires throughout the region and have found a disturbing trend that includes increasing damage, um, increasingly damaging, often uh, ineffective and operationally infeasible uh, fire suppression act actions that are occurring in more and more intact environments, including wilderness areas, inventory roadless areas, national monuments, riparian reserves, research natural areas, botanical areas, and late successional reserves. So often the mixed severity fire effects of these contemporary wildland fires bring various biological uh, benefits and trade-offs, uh, while the industrialized supp fire suppression creates um, some pretty lasting environmental impacts. Um, so although we document the, the impact of fire suppression throughout the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains, and we've been doing that since 2012, in 2018, we saw a significant increase uh, in the intensity and the scale of wilderness and wildland dozer lines. Um, these sort of dozer lines were previously really kind of unheard of in our region and have now become uh, routine just in the last few years. So in July of 2018, uh, Oregon Department of Forestry and the Medford District BLM uh, bulldozed approximately 32 miles across the nearly 25,000 acre Soda Mountain Wilderness Area, which is embedded within the Cascade Siskiyou National Monument. These dozer lines disturbed Native American archeological sites, riparian areas, unique plant communities, rare plant populations, and wilderness habitats, while also spreading star thistle and non-native grasses such as cheatgrass, and Medusa head across the entire wilderness area. Uh, additionally, the Pacific Crest Trail and other wilderness trails were either destroyed or heavily impacted um, through fire line and dozer line construction, uh, but almost none of these dozer lines actually contributed to fire containment or were used directly for, uh, to control the fire. Um, so in fact, you know, wilderness dozer lines, more wilderness dozer lines were approved in the 2018 fire season within 50 miles of Medford, Oregon, then were approved in the last 12 years combined on all federal lands in Oregon and Washington. So this is an increasing problem. Um, these dozer lines were built through headwater streams, intact forest and high mountain meadows in the Siskiyou Wilderness area. There was dozer lines built in the Big Red Mountain Botanical Area. And there was also a lot of dozer lines that were built on the edge of the Calmeopsis Wilderness in the wildlands surrounding the wilderness area. Um, fire managers actually uh, uh, authorized and approved a wilderness dozer line that would have bulldozed across the entire Calmeopsis wilderness area. But fortunately, this dozer line was never created. Um, and most of the impacts were sustained in the wildlands surrounding the, the Calmeopsis wilderness. In 2021, we saw these impacts uh, intensify again, quite dramatically in Northern California, where extensive bulldozing occurred in nearly every ridgeline and nearly every trail in the proposed 
proposed Pattison Wilderness near Hayfork, California. Uh, crews were creating between 20 and 200 foot wide dozer lines uh, in that proposed wilderness area. There were also dozer lines built in the Trinity Alps Wilderness, the Shasta Wilderness, Mount Shasta Wilderness, and 11 miles were built in the Bucks Lake Wilderness in the Northern Sierra Nevada. Uh, that included 5.6 miles of dozer line that was built directly on top of or adjacent to the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, and since, 2000, since 2020 in the Bucks Lake Wilderness, we've seen essentially every trail in that wilderness area damaged by fire suppression activities, including heavy snagging where hundreds of large old trees and snags were removed, um, and also the dozer line construction. So there's a lot of impacts there associated with soils, native plant communities, erosion, uh, sedimentation, scenic values, recreational values, noxious weeds, et cetera. Um, and you know, basically these impacts are mounting, they are often unnecessary, and they're expanding with each passing fire season. Um, dozer lines also include the felling of large snags and trees and the clearing of large host site, hoist sites, safety zones and, zones and helicopter landing pads. They often include the destruction of uh, backcountry trails and oftentimes in fire line rehabilitation process includes putting a lot of uh, down material, dead and down material over those fire lines, creating problems for you know, future fire uh, management and, and fire severities in the future due to that fire line rehabilitation. Um, so there's you know, a lot of impacts that are occurring out there. And like I said, those impacts are mounting each year um, and we're just seeing an, a dramatic increase in these kinds of impacts during the fire season across the landscape. Um, in recent years, uh, vehicle use uh, and on dozer lines and wilderness areas has also become much more common. Um, fire retardant has also dropped in a lot of areas, um, including fire retardant and firefighting gels, which are uh, toxic to aquatic organisms and are dropped in large quantities in fire areas. Um, we have documented numerous misapplications in headwater streams, in wetlands, in springs, and also in large fish bearing streams and rivers in the region. Um, and this can and does lead to fish kills and impacts to aquatic organisms when misapplications occur. High severity backburns are also lit um, occasionally in low slope positions and under uh, very active uh, fire weather. Um, and these fire, these uh, backburns tend to burn uphill rapidly at high severity, um, and they tend to eliminate a lot of the fire refugia that would otherwise exist there on the landscape. So for example, um, in 2002, in the Biscuit Fire here in Southwestern Oregon, it was about a 500,000 acre fire. And it's estimated that about two thirds of that fire or half of that fire, somewhere in that range, um, may have been backburned based on the, the backburn locations and the extent of the backburning that occurred. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's also just a lot of snagging and, and tree removal that occurs on these fire lines. And we've actually documented situations where fire crews have gone in and removed large diameter in-stream wood in fish bearing streams to uh, reduce fire spread or to act as containment lines. Um, so in many cases, these heavy handed suppression activities do not eliminate fire spread or contribute actively to fire containment. And instead, many of these dozer lines are breached by burning embers, uh, which ignite spot fires across primary fire lines and fire managers are increasingly building dozer lines that they then don't staff when the fire approaches um, and they often burn over. Um, and then other do dozer lines are also built as contingency lines, which are getting more and more uh, intense and in increasing in scope, scope and scale. And these are dozer lines that are just never used for fire containment, they're meant as contingency. So I'd also like to touch on the significant damage done during the implementation of commercial thinning and vegetation management projects, including federal timber sales. Uh, these impacts include large tree removal, the degradation of old growth or late successional forests and northern spotted owl habitat downgrades and removal. Um, all of these impacts regularly occur in timber sales that are in, in so-called restoration projects on Forest Service and BLM lands. So although environmental assessments and other NEPA documents often unrealistically claim that these projects will have beneficial effects, many of these impacts associated with commercial logging, uh, canopy reduction, large tree removal, snag removal, road construction, yarding impacts, and the modification of wildlife habitat are inherent to the commercial logging process and occur whether the EA calls the project a logging project, a restoration project, a fuel reduction project, or a forest resiliency project. Um, these impacts um, are extensive, they're real, and they're becoming more widespread.
Um, and a lot of times fire land managers often claim that they're emphasizing their treatments, their logging treatments in unhealthy or overly dense forests. Um, and many situations, the agency is actually targeting a lot of relatively open space stands, but closed canopy stands. Um, and these are the more mature forests that you see in these photographs. Um, they often target these stands, um, despite their natural fire resilience. Uh, their resilience to drought and beetle outbreaks and things like that. And they also represent high quality northern spotted owl habitats in a lot of cases. Um, so these stands do not need uh, treatment. They will not benefit from the proposed restoration logging treatments and will in fact be heavily impacted by the treatments that occur. Um, and in fact, it's actually routine for federal managers to target these mature and late successional and old growth forest habitats for commercial logging under the guise of restoration. This includes nearly every timber sale proposed in the last decade or more on public lands in southwestern Oregon and northwestern California. For example, the South Fork and the timber sale and the Bear Country timber sale, like the Crawford timber sale before them, um, was propo are proposed uh, to industrial log some of the last occupied uh, northern spotted owl habitat in the western half of the Klamath National Forest. Uh, the Upper Briggs Restoration Project and Timber Sale includes old forest logging in a key watershed and in an important fishery for the Illinois River. Uh, this project was proposed to address overblown concerns about fire severity, and essentially the analysis said that it was a foregone conclusion that in the next fire event, uh, these stands would burn at high severity under catastrophic effects. But in fact, about just a few months before this project was approved, about 80% of the project area in the Briggs Creek watershed burned at low severity. Um, and, the, and the agency went ahead and approved the project anyway, saying that the fire did not create the kind of structural conditions that they required, and that the fire actually did not uh, create, or did not burn with enough intensity, uh, create the enough mortality or sufficiently open the forest stands. So they're gonna do that through logging. Uh, the Pickett West timber sale depicted in the bottom three photographs was designed by the BOM and specifically tiered to the Rogue Basin Cohesive Forest Restoration Strategy. This is a proposal developed by the Nature Conservancy and a local forest restoration collaborative. Using the language of restoration and support from Nature Conservancy scientists who are writing portions of the EA and providing scientific citations to support the logging of old trees and northern spotted owl habitat. This timber sale included about half the units of the sale were between 150 and 240 years old and proposed logging treatments that would undoubtedly reduce complex old forest stands to 30% canopy cover, removing suitable northern, habitat, northern spotted owl habitat and damaging old forest values. Fortunately, this project was uh, withdrawn due to public outrage and impacts to the red trevol, one of the Northern Spotted Owl's main, main pro, prey sources. Um, but it's not just that they're targeting old stands in these projects, it's, and it's that they're actually, you know, nearly every federal timber sale also includes an old growth or old forest logging component where large old fire resistant trees are proposed for removal. Um, and these sort of projects are being proposed in a lot of sensitive areas, including roadless areas, late successional reserves, and essentially nearly everywhere in the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains and beyond. Another thing that's occurring quite frequently these days is group selection logging that's often proposed in these projects. They specifically target uh, mature and old forest stands with the creation of clearings, openings, or, what, or staggered clear cuts up to four acres in size and up to 30% of a given stand. Um, so the goal is actually to remove large fire resistant carbon rich stands of trees and replace them with young regeneration. Um, the, the actual effects of this sort of logging uh, will reduce fire resistance, uh, increase fuel density and continuity in the understory, uh, dry out forest stands and expose them to increasing sunlight and drying winds. So um, this not only decreases fire resilience by removing the most fire resistant portions of the stands and the most carbon rich portions, uh, and then it will replace them with, again, that dense understory regeneration. Um, and, you know, this is also a significant impact to northern spotted owl habitat because they're targeting these older stands. Um, and will certainly set back owl habitat for decades, you know, up to maybe 80 or 100 years um, until these stands recover to the situation that they have been in. And that's particularly troubling given the precipitous declines of the northern spotted owl throughout the Pacific Northwest. So to give you an idea of how this affects uh, fire issues and fuel loading, um, you know, although fire severity is generally impacted mostly by climate, uh, 
You also have a lot less resistance to fire in these stands because of the removal of the fire resistant trees. And so um, the BOM has actually done analysis around this group selection logging and have uh, identified that, the, that they will create brush and slash fuel types and that, that those fuel types will quote, be more volatile and more susceptible to high rates of fire caused mortality. Stands could exhibit higher flame lengths, rates of spread and fire intensity and fires started within these stands could be difficult to initially attack and control and the overall fire hazard will increase in these stands. So that's the BOM's own analysis. We've also seen in the Applegate River watershed on BOM lands where there's a lot of areas that they've previously treated with commercial thinning and so-called forest health prescriptions. And they have then subsequently become the center of a large uh, scale flathead fur borer outbreak. So rather than promoting stand resilience and these previously thinning, uh, previously implemented thinning prescriptions appear to be interacting with climate change and prolonged drought cycles and have become the most susceptible portions of the landscape um, to beetle mortality in the Applegate Valley. So these mortality events were then followed uh, with post-disturbance logging, which removed both live and dead street trees in the affected stands. And then finally, there's post-fire logging, uh, which has significant impacts to soils, habitat conditions, natural forest regeneration, noxious weed spread, and reduces habitat complexity for many, many decades following uh, the disturbance. It also reduces wildlife habitat and it starves future stands of snags and downed wood habitat that is really important for wildlife, soil fertility, water holding capacity, and regeneration. Uh, Post-fire logging is nearly always implemented as clear-cut logging and also includes artificial tree planting and plantation development that will increase fire risks and simplify forest structure for many decades. So like other forms of the megafire active management approach, uh, post-fire logging has many negative impacts and the overall impact of this active management approach is leading to increased impacts across the entire landscape. So that, you know, we're, what we're advocating for is that we question and in many cases reverse this trend um, so that we can actually sustain healthy forests, intact fire regimes, biodiversity and hab habitat camp connectivity on the landscape scale. So that's kind of a quick overview of the kind of impacts that we're seeing from this active management approach in the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains. Um, and you're, you're seeing similar types of projects and similar types of impacts uh, throughout, throughout public lands in the West. So that's what I've got. Thanks so much, Luke. We have a ton of questions. Everybody's really excited about this material. We have a lot to get through. Um, so we're going to go to one question here. I think we have time for is, um, this is from Robert Vandehoek, uh, is bulldozer use done under contract with private companies in, uh, slash individuals? If so, do you know if the um, these are Caucasian white men owned companies, individuals doing bulldozing, or are these bulldozing activities done internally by the BLM fire employees? Well, during a fire event, a lot of the work is done by contract crews, but at least the authorizations to approve bulldozer use in wilderness areas, which is about the only area that um, bulldozer use is, is discouraged, um, that authorization comes from regional foresters. Um, through the Forest Service. Um, it's a little easier to authorize on BOM lands. Uh, they don't have to go through their state forester. They do it on a, on a local level. But the decisions to, make the, to, to construct those dozer lines are made by uh, forest managers, federal land managers, and also by fire managers from incident command teams. Great, sounds good. Let's see, um, maybe we have time for one more here. Uh, Daniel Rossman asks, um, accepting the premise that the restoration projects are often used as a guide to support harmful practices, especially in old growth stands, are there examples of good restoration projects, perhaps thinning in areas previously clear cut and turned into tree plantations that do not reflect natural diversity and tree diameter? I would say that there, you know, that Currently, the restoration paradigm is somewhat of a mixed bag. Um, by and large, the problem is that every federal restoration project includes a timber sale component. Um, and so you, get, you end up with these old forest uh, units and old forest and old tree removal in 
everything that I've, just about every project that I've seen in the last 10 or 15 years here on federal lands. And so, um, you know, occasionally you see the Forest Service and the BOM implement some, you know, uh, responsible fuel treatments around communities adjacent to homes, maybe some prescribed fire directly adjacent to those communities. Um, and some of those things can be beneficial in terms of community and home protection. Um, and I think that the, they should be focusing on those kind of from the community outward so that they can allow a lot of those natural processes, such as, you know, fire to occur um, on the larger landscape and in those backcountry areas. So by protecting the local communities a little bit better and emphasizing that, perhaps we can uh, have a little bit less impact in some of our more intact environments in some of the backcountry areas. Awesome. Let's move to uh, Brian Baker now. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Baker. I am the conservation director at Los Padres Forest Watch. I am kind of our mapping GIS person um, in, in this, this crew here. I, I do a lot of work looking at uh, uh, basically data maps, um, anything that I can access uh, to try to understand uh, all of these questions um, a little bit better. One of the big questions that we are currently trying to answer in uh, in our work is how do we measure fire severity? There has been a lot of work on this over the last couple of decades, and there are some decent methods out there, the ones that are most commonly used uh, in the scientific literature, but they have some flaws that are, are um, sometimes pretty serious and they disproportionately affect um, how we look at areas that are thinned versus unthinned. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into that a little bit. But first, I just want to um, give you a sense of what I'm talking about when, I, when I'm talking about fire severity. So this is just an example area. This is mixed conifer forest near Yosemite National Park. Um, this is the uh, area that burned in the rim fire, but this is right before the fire. So this is uh, you know, mature mixed conifer forest. This is in 2012. And this is what it looked like right after the fire in 2013. And so what you see is this mosaic, uh, which, which Dominic mentioned earlier, um, you see this mosaic that's made up of a lot of low severity fire where you have very little tree mortality. Um, and then there are these patches of high severity fire where you can have up to hundred percent tree mortality, like you see uh, in this area right here. And then there are these areas where maybe you have like 50% high severity. And th those are uh, the more moderate severity uh, areas that sort of link low and, and high severity together. Now, when we actually are looking at data we're looking at these, these fire severity classification systems that are um, basically producing a data set that looks like this. So this is the exact same area as what you're seeing here, um, but it's just in a format where we can actually um, see what uh, is being classified as high severity or low severity or anything else. And this is done using um, some pretty interesting techniques that take satellite images before and after a fire and look at how the vegetation changes between those. Uh, and remember these colors. So you're going to see some of these colors later, and I, I won't have the legend um, for those, but just remember that high is red and um, these uh, green and bluish colors are, are low. So what I just showed you, though, the, the satellite imagery I just showed you um, a, a minute ago, that's from Google Earth. That's high resolution satellite imagery. You can actually pick out individual trees. But for the most part, fire severity data is being collected using this relatively low resolution uh, Landsat imagery, which is great for doing all sorts of things at this really big, broad landscape scale. Um, but the pixels, each pixel is only about 30 by 30 meters. So we're, we're talking about fairly coarse resolution. We cannot pick out individual trees. This is that exact same area. This is what it looks like before the fire. Uh, the color is not exactly what you would see if you were in space and you were looking at this area. It's kind of a false color. Um, so this is before the fire and this is after the fire. You can see where there has been some changes to the canopy cover and that's what the satellite is actually detecting. So it's really looking at the difference in greenness from pre-fire to post-fire satellite imagery. So I want to give you an example of how this matters when we're looking at areas that have been thinned. So this is an area in Arizona. 
pretty close to the Arizona New Mexico border. Uh, this is Ponderosa Pine Forest, and this is uh, from 2007. It's before thinning occurred and before the fire in 2011 occurred, which I'll show in a second. Uh, so this is mature Ponderosa Pine, uh, and then you can really easily make out where the thinning occurred. So it's a pretty intensive canopy cover reduction. You can see a lot more uh, of the ground. You can see a lot of bare ground, and then um, probably like some grasses will will come in and, and a lot of these canopy gaps. And then of course, this is the area that was unthinned. And this is what happens uh, when we look at right after the fire. So this is in 2011. This is just within days or weeks after the fire. You can see uh, that the wallow fire, it moved from this direction this way. So it's moving toward the north here. And uh, you can see that it burned right through the, the thinned area um, and, and toward this road over here. So if we flash forward a little bit, um, we can go just a year out from the fire, or we can go a couple years out from the fire. What we would see if we were looking at high resolution satellite imagery is that there is a lot of high severity fire in this thinning unit. However, when we look at these data sets that are created by, um, particularly there's this um, program called the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Program. That's a multi-agency effort that uh, looks at big, big fires and tries to classify fire severity. When we look at that, um, one of the methods that's in that, um, there, there are a couple different data sets that get created. This is one of them. It is classifying most of this thinning unit as low severity fire. Uh, if, I, if you were to see what it classified, you know, these unthinned areas, it would be mostly high severity fire. Um, this is not a very accurate method in these thinned areas. And this has been discussed a little bit in the literature. And that led to uh, a new method that tries to account for the fact that there is sparser vegetation. Uh, like if you have sparser vegetation before the fire, um, that can affect the sort of difference in greenness between a pre-fire and a post-fire satellite image. Uh, but even with that method, it's still missing, a, it's still misclassifying a lot of area within this thinned area. So um, when we actually went in, I, I basically went in and I tried to delineate manually uh, all of the areas that where I was seeing up to basically 100% tree mortality, where, where it's generally 75 to 100% tree mortality. And this was a very conservative estimate. You'll see that there are a lot of spaces in here where it, it was high severity. So you can see there's a huge difference here. And this has really uh, big ramifications on the scientific literature because there are so many studies out there that are using these data sets to basically try to quantify whether or not uh, these thinning units are actually working to reduce fire severity, not even talking about whether or not they're stopping fires from moving across the landscape, but whether or not they're changing fire severity outcomes. Uh, and so that's something that we talk about a little bit in our most recent paper. And it's something that uh, Chad and I are working on quite a bit more uh, now. And I just want to show you, this is um, an oblique angle. So this is that same area you can see here. The reason I bring this up is because Instead of, um, and there, there was a paper actually a couple of years ago that was basically using this exact thinning unit to say that the thinning essentially uh, drastically altered fire severity, made it uh, low severity. And they were using um, that uh, one of those um, data sets that was misclassifying most of this thin uh, portion of the landscape. And what we may actually be seeing is that the fire, it was coming from this direction, going this way. It was actually just going down slope, which is often a natural fire moderating effect. We often see that as fire moves down slope, it tends to moderate in severity naturally. Um, and so this is something where because of misclassifying fire severity, we may be missing important um, other variables that may explain what patterns we're seeing with fire severity instead. And I just want to show you another example. This is not a thinned area. This is in the San Bernardino National Forest. This is on Crafts Peak uh, in an area that would go on to burn in 2007 in the Butler II fire. This is 2003. You can see there's um, some little patches of forest here and some montane chaparral. This is mostly shrub here. Uh, this is before the fire, and this is right after the fire. You can see that almost all of these trees survived. Now, the shrubs, of course, burned, and that is confusing satellite imagery. Um, so this is what it looks like after the fire. This is a few years later after the fire. And again, you can see that this was almost entirely low severity if you're going by tree mortality. However, the 
uh, standard classification systems are classifying this as mostly high severity, even though there was basically no tree mortality here. And that has a lot to do with the fact that the shrubs burning, that changes the greenness of the image between the pre-fire and the post-fire imagery. Uh, and that, and that causes problems with how this analysis works. So this is a really important issue that we're still trying to figure out in the literature. The other thing that is important is going to be increasingly important as we see certain types of forest ecosystems burn um, for, uh, is going to be the timing of when the post-fire satellite imagery is collected. This is an area in Sonoma County in the Tubbs fire. Uh, this is before the fire burn in 2017. This is mostly redwood forest here. This is right after the fire. And if you were to collect satellite imagery to use it to create fire class uh, severity classification, um, what you would probably classify this as is mostly high severity. However, redwoods have this unique ability to epicormically sprout. They can actually re-sprout from their branches and their trunk. They can be almost, I mean, completely blackened. It looks like they're dead, um, but they are actually still alive and <clears throat> doing just fine. This is what we're talking about. A few years later, you can see that most of these redwoods actually survived and re-sprouted um, from their branches and their trunks. So, that is an important aspect as well, um, because if you if you t miss time when you're actually collecting this post-fire satellite imagery, you may um, misclassify uh, these areas as high severity. And and this is just what it looks like um, from the ground. What I'm talking about with this the redwoods, uh, other some other trees, you know, they they can flush, they can put out new needles uh, after a fire, even though most of their canopy has been uh, scorched. And then, um, you know, this is going to be uh, an issue that we're going to have to try to work out in the scientific literature more and more. Uh, that's it for me. I'm going to. Great. Thanks, questions? Brian. Um, a couple questions. What's the difference between prescribed fire and pile burning? Uh, right. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Preston, you answered, you asked this question earlier. Um, yeah. So prescribed fire, generally what we're talking about is understory burning. Um, it's usually thought of as low intensity understory burning. So it would be actually like setting an area um, uh, on fire. Uh, pile burning is where you're taking material like cut um, branches, logs, um, uh, canopy, you know, from trees that have been felled. Uh, that material is getting piled up and you'll see a lot of piles across a landscape. And then those piles are individually burned. So pile burning and prescribed fire are not the same thing, but we're often seeing uh, agencies call pile burning prescribed fire because um, they're, they're trying. I, th I think what's happening is that people tend to have this really um, nice perception of a prescribed fire. Um, but a lot of times what we're really seeing when we see, you know, an announcement that there's going to be a prescribed fire on this mountain on this, you know, next week, um, that is often pile burning that's taken place after some sort of mechanical uh, thinning, you know, logging um, activity. Great, thanks. Um, Michelle would like to know if it is not addressed in the presentations, can you discuss spring burning and the harm that um, can cause? Sure. So uh, spring burning is, it's, it's even, we're, we're actually seeing a lot of prescribed fire being done even in the winter. Um, I, I've seen many examples where um, there's pile burning and prescribed fire being done when there's still some snow on the ground. This is not when these forests, which have been around for millions of years, it is not how they evolve to deal with fire. Uh, this can have a couple of different effects. Um, it can affect understory vegetation in certain ways. So there are uh, certain shrubs that may respond um, to fire and, and certain her uh, herbaceous plants as well that may have fire cued seed germination. When you're burning under these like moisture conditions, colder conditions that may affect uh, their um, germination. So you may not see certain uh, shrubs or herbaceous plants um, germinate from seed after a prescribed fire that's done out out of the normal fire season, the natural fire season. Uh, the other thing is that, especially in the spring, you often have shrub nesting birds. Uh, you even have birds nesting in, in, in tree canopies. Um, and, and so you have chicks that are unable to fly away. Um, this is not when, again, 
uh, in the natural fire season, which would be in the summer and the fall, uh, after fledging has already happened so that birds can fly away and, and escape fire. That's not really happening during winter and spring prescribed, um, prescribed fire. Uh, so that can be a problem, especially with shrub nesting species, which are an important component of, of these uh, mature forests. Uh, and then, of course, we are talking exclusively about forest, true forest. Mostly we're talking about mixed conifer and ponderosa pine or dry, uh, or Jeffrey pine forest uh, in the Western United States. This is not really a discussion about chaparral or other shrubland ecosystems where the effects of out of season burns, prescribed burns can be um, even more apparent in those ecosystems. And I um, am happy to answer those kind of questions uh, via email or, or uh, in another way. Great, thank you. Um... Let's see, we have a couple more minutes before we got to hand it off to Chad. Um, do you, uh, what are some citations of the scientific literature that criticizes the mythology of current fire classifications? Do you have that offhand? Uh, I don't have it offhand. There are some <laughs> papers that have looked at this, uh, particularly from the late 2000s and the early um, 2010s. There have been various classification systems. Uh, we're talking about things like uh, the the delta normalized burn ratio or the relativized delta normalized burn ratio. There's also another one called the, relativi the relativized burn ratio. Um, there are different types of classifications. I will say that the most commonly used uh, satellite imagery based um, classification methods, th those are the ones that I, I showed in this presentation. And, and those are what we're seeing being used in the scientific literature to basically say these thinning treatments had an effect. Um, you know, there are also ground-based severity measurements. Um, those are just really hard to do at a, at a broad scale. So uh, I'm not trying to say that these satellite imagery-based classification systems are are bad altogether. They are actually quite useful in a lot of ways. And especially if we can find ways to apply correction factors to them, which is something Chad and I are working on right now, which is basically looking at a random sampling of pixels on the landscape and determining with high resolution satellite imagery, whether those pixels were classified correctly. Um, and so then we can come up with like a correction factor and apply that. Um, that that's something that we're looking into. Uh, but there's not a lot of true criticism or, or really there's not a lot of um, study into how this misclassification issue is affecting um, how we look at whether or not thinned areas specifically are performing in terms of how they can change fire severity. Um, that is something that had just has not been addressed very sufficiently in, in the literature and that's something we're working on right now. Okay, one more before we hand it off to Chad. Um, Charles is wondering, uh, or says, this reminds me of the data coming from the KNP complex castle fire impacts on sequoias. Is this sprouting behavior seen on that species as well? Or do you have a comment on the big headline numbers about how much of the G or SG population was lost in those fires? Much of the data is based on imagery analysis. Sure. So Chad can probably go into this a little bit more if he wants to, but I will say, um, the, the, the numbers that we saw right after the KMP complex or the castle fire, um, the numbers that we saw in terms of uh, giant sequoia mortality, those were really based not on field measurements, but on some of the, the one of the methods that I just showed you, basically, um, they were looking at, not only were they looking at really uh, immediately collected post-fire satellite imagery, which again can miss, uh, in, in sequoias, it would be flushing, which is actually just being able to, to grow. Oh, I, actually, Chad might correct me on that. Um, I, I don't know if they can flush, but I do know that they, as long as they have a little bit of like 5% of their canopy is not burned, um, they can, they're, they're still alive and they can, they can do just fine. The problem is, when you're looking at Landsat images, which is what I showed you earlier, that's pretty coarse resolution, a single pixel may only cover about one single giant sequoia. And the question is, can you really can you really differentiate whether or not there's any greenness left in the canopy with a single 30 by 30 meter pixel? Um, that, is a, that is a problem that has not been addressed. We have yet to see any real ground truthing of a lot of those data that were talked about um, after those fires. Um, I suspect that we will see that uh, the mortality rates um, are a lot lower than what has been reported. Um, but again, this is something I know, um, I know Chad is looking into a lot more um, 
specifically than I am. And just Luke, uh, Luke Bryan, you asked a question, what are my favorite GIS programs? QGIS is what I use. It's an open source, um, free software. It's really great. Uh, I think it's fairly accessible to people. Um, and uh, I'm happy to talk more about that uh, via email or something. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Chad, um, you ready to go? I am. Thanks. Uh, I'll share my screen and uh, pull up my presentation. All right. Can everyone see that okay? Mm. It may be, there may be a slight delay. Is it coming up? Not yet. Let me try something else here. All right, I'll try to share my screen again. If, if for some reason it's not working, and actually I'm gonna turn off my video if there's a bandwidth problem, maybe that's it. Let me try one more time. All right, tell me if that's coming up okay now. There you yep. go. You just need to put it in share mode. Okay. Good, good. All right, so um, uh, I'm just going to talk briefly because I want to make sure we have some, some time for Q&A. But basically, I'm going to cover what I see as a false debate, a false dialogue, uh, a false narrative about thinning the wildfires, that it's being promoted by the logging industry and by agencies like the Forest Service and BLM that are quite literally in the commercial logging business and are part of the logging industry. Um, this narrative um, that thinning is effective uh, as a fire management strategy is being used to promote the, a, a massive increase in commercial logging uh, right now on public lands. And so I'm gonna disentangle this a little bit and talk about what it really means. Now I have a lot more information on this if people are interested in uh, my book that came out last year, uh, Smokescreen, Debunking Wildfire Myths to Save Our Forests and Our Climate. And um, so if uh, folks are interested, I wrote it for non-scientists, but I have hundreds of scientific studies cited in the end notes. All right, so the first key myth about this is the idea that denser forests are gonna burn more intensely. And the, 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 the narrative basically is telling the general public and policymakers and reporters that denser forests, you know, for mature forests that have uh, higher canopy cover, more trees per acre, more biomass, um, that those forests, because they have more biomass, there's more to burn and they're gonna burn more intensely, uh, ostensibly because of fuel accumulation. That's, the, that's what we're being told. The problem is, is that study after study after study are finding exactly the opposite. We're finding that forests that are denser, that have more biomass, that have more canopy cover, that have higher levels of protection from logging, those forests tend to burn at equal or lower intensities. In fact, most of the time they burn less intensely. Now, why is that? Well, it's because denser forests uh, with more biomass, more canopy cover, um, they have more cooling shade from that canopy cover. And that creates a microclimate that's less conducive to fire uh, or less conducive to, to more intense fire. It certainly can happen there if the weather is right, but it's less likely, relatively speaking, simply because you have more shade uh, more cooling shade and more moist conditions from that denser canopy cover. In addition, uh, a denser forest acts like a windbreak against the winds that drive the flames. And that windbreak effect will slow down the fire and actually oftentimes make it burn more inten uh, le less intensely. In similar fashion, uh, this notion um, that forests that haven't burned in a long time, that they will burn much more intensely when a fire occurs, ostensibly because of fuel accumulation, that has also been completely discredited in the scientific literature by most of the studies out there. Um, there is a, a, a fairly significant body of scientific re research on this over the past 16 years now, and uh, the strong weight of scientific evidence indicates that forests that have not burned in the longest period of time either burn about the same uh, in, in terms of fire intensity as other forests, or they burn at lower levels of fire intensity or severity. And this is just one example, those black bars at the bottom um, uh, of, of each of these uh, in this bar graph, that's, that's the high intensity fire, the gray is moderate and the light gray is low intensity. 
And, um, and you can see that bar on the right, that's the most long unburned. Uh, TSF means time since fire. And so those are forests that haven't burned in at least 75 years. In many cases, they haven't burned in over 100 years. And yet they had the lowest levels of high severity fire. That's from Odin et al. 2010, but there are similar results in Miller et al. 2012 um, and many other uh, studies on this. Uh, many cases finding the same fire intensities or severities and in other cases finding lower. And the reality is, is that it's not fundamentally about forest density. Uh, to the extent that forest density matters at all, it tends to matter in the opposite direction from what most people think. But the reality is that forest fires are driven mostly by weather and climate factors, and therefore also by climate change. Um, we, I'm a co-author of the largest scientific analysis ever done on this. Uh, we published that uh, in 2016 in Ecosphere, that's Bradley et al. 2016. And what we found was that weather and climate were dominant um, as, 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 uh, as factors driving fire. We also found that forests with the fewest environmental protections and the most logging or most intensive logging actually burn the most intensely, not the least intensely. And uh, so it's completely contrary to what the Forest Service is telling people. Um, the reality is the more trees you remove from the forest, the faster and hotter fires tend to burn, oftentimes toward vulnerable towns. Other researchers looked at this too in various modeling scenarios. Uh, and what they're finding is in most cases, commercial thinning burns more intensely, not less intensely in wildfires. The bars going to the right are more intense. The bars going to the left are less intense. So it's not that if an area is commercially thinned, it's always going to burn at high intensity. That's not the case. You know, you can certainly find commercial thinning areas that burn at low intensity, but it's about the averages. It's about what happens across the landscape on average. In most cases, the commercial thinning areas are burning um, at equal or higher intensities than uh, unthinned mature forests. And this is really important to keep in mind because what's happening after every big fire season, the Forest Service will go around to big fires and they'll find a couple of examples where uh, a thinned area burned at low intensity and they'll say, oh, look, thinning works. The problem is that's cherry picking because you can find the same uh, for unthinned forests that burn at low, moderate and high intensity. And you can find the same for thinning. Um, you have to use all the data across the entire fire to find out what's really going on. And that's in fact what I did when I looked at the Creek Fire. Uh, this is a, a two, 2020 fire that burned in the Southern Sierra Nevada, 380,000 acre fire. So there's a lot of areas that were unthinned, a lot of areas that were thinned. And I looked at all the, the entire fire and all the data. And what I found is that the areas with so-called fuel reduction logging, including commercial thinning, but also post-fire logging, those areas had the highest levels of fire severity, the highest percentages of high severity fire. Whereas the areas with the lowest fire severity um, were actually um, earlier fires that had no post-fire logging and then burned again in the creek fire. So in other words, basically just mixed intensity fire uh, being restored on the landscape with no tree removal. That actually had the lowest fire severity. I looked at this issue again in the antelope fire that burned in far Northern California last year. And what I looked at was a specific thing that I didn't look at in my Creek Fire paper, and that's what I called cumulative severity. And basically what that means is you're taking into, into account tree mortality from thinning itself, which can be significant, and tree mortality from the fire, not just tree mortality from the fire. Because of course, if you're not including tree mortality from thinning, then you're, you're underestimating the overall cumulative impact of those, of those logging projects. What I found was that cumulative severity was significantly higher in commercial thinning units, overall 59% tree mortality compared to unthinned forests, which had 39% tree mortality. And um, so tree, thinning is a significant source of tree mortality. Bottom line is that thinning is killing far more trees than it's preventing from being killed. And last, I'll talk about you know, some of the key things that we, we looked at in one of the key components of the De La Sala et al. 2022 paper, the Sisyphus paper uh, that Dominic mentioned initially. And um, you know, one thing we looked at, one of the things we looked at was this trio of articles by Forest Service scientists that was published in Ecological Applications last year. And these, um, these Forest Service scientists falsely claimed that the science is settled and, uh, and, uh, and that the conclusion is that commercial thinning is very effective as a fire management approach. 
And they said that uh, there's little doubt about this anymore and the science is settled. Two major problems with this. Number one, when we actually look at their own papers, the very papers where they claim that the science is settled and there's little doubt, they actually admit repeatedly the opposite. They admit that thinning can cause higher surface fuel loads, end quote. Thinning, quote, can contribute to high intensity surface fire and elevated levels of associated tree mortality, end quote, as well as, quote, elevated fire intensities, end quote. They also admit thinning, quote, can lead to increased surface wind speed and fuel heating, which allows for increase, increased rates of fire spread in thin forests, end quote. Faster rate of spread, more intense fire can often happen, and of course it does. And last, they admit that thinning, quote, may increase the risk of fire by increasing the sunlight exposure to the forest floor, drying vegetation, promoting understory growth, and increasing wind speeds, end quote. In other words, changing the microclimate in ways that I described earlier to create essentially hotter, drier, and windier conditions that are more conducive to more rapid fire spread and often more intense fire spread. So that's the first problem. They uh, had this conclusion in their abstracts um, that says, well, this, the matter is settled, uh, thinning is effective. And then um, uh, when they actually start talking about the scientific literature, they have to admit the opposite. Second major problem is that they cite a number of studies to say, well, there are really some studies that really do say that thinning is effective uh, at curbing fire uh, intensity or severity. And um, when we looked at those studies very, very carefully, we found that they did not support those conclusions. Uh, interestingly, these studies actually did make that claim in the abstracts, but the results contradicted the claim. So for example, one of them, uh, Povac et al, 2020, um, the maps show that the thin forests had mostly higher intensity fire, uh, not mostly low intensity. Uh, Pritchard et al, 2020, figure three, showed that the lowest fire intensity was in areas of previous wildfire that reburned again in the Carlton complex fire um, and, uh, and had lower fire intensities overall than the thinning categories. So the conclusion should have been objectively that the most effective approach is to allow mixed intensity wildfires to occur not to, to do these logging projects on the landscape. And then another one, Joachim Kent et al, uh, showed that thin, thin forests had fewer live trees and less carbon in them than uh, areas of reburn wildfires with no thinning. Again, the conclusion should be, let's have more managed wildfire in the landscape, more mixed intensity fire, not more thinning and tree removal. Um, now, I know that um, there was uh, there have been some questions about giant sequoias, so I want to address this just briefly before uh, I end uh, my presentation and, and do some Q&A. Um, and just to talk about this, because as Brian mentioned, it is absolutely the case that these fire severity maps are substantially overstating how much high severity fire there is in these giant sequoia groves. Um, there are, they're, they're missing a lot of tree survival. Uh, giant sequoias do have adaptations to kind of recreate their green crown after fires. Um, even if the nearly all of the crown has been lost in fire, even 98, 99% in some cases. Um, and, uh, and there's high survival of a lot of these giant sequoias, even with you know, very high levels of, of crown loss, they'll just recreate their crown afterwards. Not only that, but giant sequoias regenerate in spectacular fashion after fire, especially after high intensity fire. This is an example in the Nelder Grove. Um, this is a, a picture I took four years post fire um, in the Nelder Grove after the railroad fire. And the highest levels of sequoia regeneration by far and where they're growing the fastest is in the high intensity fire patches. Moderate intensity is second, and there's almost no giant sequoia regeneration in the low intensity fire areas. So it's just an important note that mixed intensity fire is not a catastrophe for giant sequoias. In fact, it's essential to their reproduction, and it's a really, really important thing to keep in mind. All right, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing there and would be happy to answer any questions. Great. Um, I have one here for, from, uh, let's see, Brent Cornelius. If dense forest burns burn less intense, why do we have, why do we lose so many sequoias and giant old pines in recent fires? Well, um, you can always have mixed intensity fire in any forest condition. And, and that's why I stressed earlier that 
you know, even in the, the densest, oldest forest, you're going to have a mix of low, moderate, and high intensity fire in any wildfire because mixed intensity, uh, mixed intensity fire is natural and it's driven by the weather. If you have hotter, drier, windier conditions at a given moment, then you're going to have more moderate and high intensity fire, regardless of the forest conditions. And um, then, you know, typically in the evening, the winds die down, the relative humidity goes up, the temperatures go down. You're going to get more low and moderate intensity fire conditions. The question is the averages, right? You know, it's not like you're never going to get high intensity fire in dense old forest. It happens, you know, frequently, but it's going to happen less frequently overall than it's going to happen in forests where there's been commercial thinning or other types of logging. Those areas are going to tend to burn on average more intensely more of the time. Great. Um, here's another one from Stacy uh, Tabor. Is the Forest Service et al. actually acting maliciously or do they really believe that their science is right? Or is it more that they are responding to political pressures? It seems awfully devious and I would think or hope that, the mo that most Forest Service employees are there because they love forests and want to do the right thing. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And, and, and before I answer, I just want to just follow up a little bit on the, the previous question because I think there's um, an important aspect of this. If you do have a dense old forest that happens to burn at high intensity, which is going to happen in some places in any fire season, it turns out that that's incredibly important wildlife habitat. There are countless plant and animal species that have evolved over millennia to depend on that specific habitat condition, mature forest that burns at high intensity. We call it snag forest habitat or also known as uh, complex early seral forest. And lots of woodpeckers and cavity nesters, shrub nesting species, a lot of um, uh, flying insects attracted to the wildflowers and flowering shrubs. Uh, it's really, really important habitat for a whole lot of species. And so I just wanted to mention that. Um, but as to the question about the motivations, um, I think that the, the question framed it really well because my answer is all the above. It really is a mix. Uh, there's no question that, are, that, that the money, in my view, is the primary influence. Um, we need to get the Forest Service and the BLM out of the commercial logging business. Congress needs to act. Uh, pe people in the public and activist communities need to put pressure on members of Congress, including progressives, including Democrats. We need to put pressure on them to take action and get the Forest Service out of the commercial logging business, BLM too. Uh, we need to protect uh, our, our public lands from commercial logging. That doesn't mean you don't have any forest management happening. It just means they're not in the logging business um, where they're looking for justifications to justify removing big trees and do, doing clear-cut logging projects, which is what's happening right now. I will say there's also, I think, a cultural aspect to this. You know, these are land managers that, that you know, came up through forestry schools and they were taught that, you know, everything in the forest is fuel and the more you remove from the forest, that's more, that's the more you're doing fuel reduction. Um, you know, foresters are not really scientists um, in, in, in many cases. You can have research foresters that have research backgrounds, but in most cases, foresters are more practitioners and they're not necessarily versed in the science. And so, you know, if they're told by others that, you know, this, this is, you know, what's happening, you, you have to re remove the fuel from this forest because it's going to burn too intensely. I think a lot of them have a good faith belief, even if it's incorrect based on the science. But fr frankly, primarily, it's the money. Oh, it's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> Robert Vandehoek has a uh, question. Does the photo of sequoia seedlings under burned I see. Does the photo of sequoia seedlings under burned pines, and if so, how did the seeds of the adult sequoia trees get to being under the pine trees, possibly wind dispersed during winds in the fire? Yeah, I mean, there, there were, um, it's mostly um, just mixed conifer forest, but there were a small number of, of, of giant sequoias in, in that area. Uh, it's interesting, though, because there's some pretty good research on how far wind can disperse seeds from cones, from live trees. And, and based on that research, uh, land managers years ago concluded, well, if you have a, a high, high intensity fire patch that's more than a few dozen acres in size, it won't regenerate because they thought, well, the wind can't move the seeds that far. The problem is, is that a forest ecosystem is not just trees. And it's not just trees and shrubs. It's also wildlife species. 
And the fact is you have um, small mammals and birds that are moving seeds and cones all over the forest all the time, including after fires. And this is a really, really big factor. They can move those seeds at any distance from the nearest live tree. And so we're seeing really abundant, vigorous, natural forest regeneration much, much farther away from the nearest live surviving tree than you would ever predict from wind dispersal. Great. Okay, I think we're going to open it up to um, all the other folks here. Um, let's see, I have a question for, uh, let's see, Dr. John Gardner says, um, while we try to persuade decision makers on management of federal forests, private logging, clear cutting runs rampant with John Hancock threatening to clear cut most of our forests in Southwest Oregon, what can be done Scientific argument is unlikely to influence this be um, activity before the destruction of our forest is complete. And that can be, um, would anybody, any, anybody could answer this question? Well, I would say that federal land management and private land management are certainly two different uh, beasts. Um, I think that, you know, but in terms of how you can influence that, those kind of activities, I think it's similar in that you know, you're going to have to change your state forest practices act, which is, you know, on some level has that discussion has started in Oregon. Um, ironically, at the same time, um, a lot of the industrial timber interests have really been ramping up their, their cut and their timber production. They've been shortening their rotations. Um, and there's been a lot, you know, what we're seeing is this increase in Wall Street uh, investment companies taking over a lot of these timber companies and as bad as the timber companies could be, um, their intent was to, to grow and sell timber. Whereas a lot of these investment companies intent is specifically to uh, increase revenues for their shareholders. And so they're often cutting and running. Um, and I think that ultimately that problem is, is dictated on a state level. And so um, although there's been some, some, ch some changes recently in the Oregon Forest Practices Act, which is pretty, uh, archaic, um, I think that you're going to need to follow a lot of the same approaches we do on federal land in terms of, you know, contacting your elected officials, um, documenting those impacts on a local and regional scale, um, and, you know, just really getting the word out to the public as to what's going on. I think a lot of people think today that uh, the intensity of logging is decreasing given our um, given the knowledge we have today of the impacts of commercial logging, but in fact, the opposite is occurring. So I think that ultimately we just need to, uh, you know, up our advocacy and, and engage our elected officials and demand that the Forest Practices Act in, in Oregon change, um, because currently, you know, it's, 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 in, it's on a pretty, uh, pretty bad trajectory and, and the, the logging is increasing. The big, the big wide clear cuts that we're seeing on the ridges are, are showing up more and more often. Um, and so I think it's a combination of advocacy um, and education. Yeah, let, me, let me jump in on that. I think, uh, well, Luke is right on that, on that end of the spectrum. There's also a way that we could reward landowners that are doing good stewardship. And you know, while it's not perfect, and has many blemishes, the Forest Stewardship Council certification process generally is better than an industrial logging model, especially for uh, non-industrialized family uh, forest owners that might want to do the right thing and should get rewarded accordingly. So I think we also need to look at legitimate incentive, incentive uh, incentives that are out there, easements, conservation, fee title, and uh, FSC certification, not industry certification, but independent certification that could recognize those landowners that could do things uh, in a leadership position. Yeah, and I'll just add very briefly that um, I, I agree with uh, the, the various uh, reforms that can be made, you know, strengthening the state forest practices laws and, and financial incentives. But to put a fine point on it, I would say you know, one thing that we have to mention is, of course, lawsuits. Um, we need more lawsuits uh, to enforce environmental laws, um, state forest practices acts. You know, they are difficult to enforce, but those lawsuits do succeed sometimes. We're seeing some recent successes in California on private forest lands, for example. So we need more of that, more of that forest watch and litigation. But we also need to press our policymakers 
at state and federal levels to allocate resources for outright land acquisition from willing sellers to acquire a lot, of, lot more private forest lands into protected public ownership um, and also um, uh, resources for conservation easements just to you know basically pay landowners to not log their forests anymore. Uh, so I think that those are those are key things that we can we can employ in the future. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, we could talk about this all day. We really appreciate you guys sticking with us this long. Um, we're going to ask a couple more questions. And for those of you, um, panelists included, can stick around for a little longer. We'll try and go through as many as we can. And, and do remember that we will be sending unanswered questions, answers to unanswered, you, yeah, um, with, the, with the recording. <laughs> so with that, um, Katie asks, um, Dr. De La Salle spoke of this negative public perceptions of wildfire. Even some social researchers use the loaded catastrophic wildfire when me measuring public perception, which can bias and skew findings. Is anyone aware of any social science that studies how it, to effectively change perceptions on the issue so they can align with the physical science? Are you working with any social science scientists on this issue? Dom, Luke, anybody? I'm on mute, so here I am. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'll chime in quickly, and I think the JMP folks might want to feel this one too, because they're they're a lot more adept at social media skills than I am. But anyway, I think you know that's that's a great question, and Chad and I and others, uh, David Johns and myself, have written about changing our language because perspectives matter so much in how we see the world. And I've been on many different press uh, bus tours of burned landscapes. We all get out of the bus. Everyone's looking at the same landscape and you know the fire scientists and the logging interests say, oh, we gotta log those forests that they're dead anyhow. And th those of us that are scientists say, well, you know, that's pretty cool. The forest is rejuvenating itself. Uh, there are birds and small mammals and all kinds of pollinators that are coming in, woodpeckers. Uh, we see it differently, right? And how you see the world affects your perspective. And we see it in the polling on fires. Most of the public is okay with prescribed burning, low intensity fires, but they think otherwise about big fire mosaics. We see it in Congress. I dealt with it two weeks ago. Uh, the, the catastrophe speak. We need to change it as uh, leaders in our own field first, and then work with communication experts. And we've got communication folks on our team, uh, the JMP folks, uh, Ralph Blumers and others that are doing wonderful videos that are showing what happens to these fires that run through an, an older forest and kill all the trees. It's not a disaster, it's circle of life. And so getting that material out there uh, is helping, but it's a huge uphill battle because there's so much misinformation out there about catastrophes on the nightly news that show homes burning down and that, you know, the fear of fire is legitimate. And we've got to overcome that fear of fire by saying, you know, there's a way that we could get to coexistence and it's not logging in the back country. And I think social media can play a really big role in that. So I'll turn that over to the social media logs. Well, I think we're running out of time, but, but I'll, I'll leave it to the, the moderators uh, to, to say if we have a couple more minutes, but I would just say, I agree with that. I think it's a great question. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's been work that's been done by social scientists quantitatively yet on that question, but it's a, it's a great question. I'm gonna start thinking about that. Maybe we'll reach out to some folks. There's a lot of qualitative work that's been done. There's no question that the language that's used matters and influences opinion, uh, but it would be great to quantify that. And, um, and, and yeah, but mo mostly we just need to start changing the conversation as Dominic said that uh, you know, when these areas burn, including those areas of high intensity, you know, if they're not logged, that's actually habitat creation, not habitat loss. Great, we have a question from Monica. Um, this one's for Luke. Uh, do most fires have similar proportion of backburn as the biscuit fire? In other words, do most fires have at least 50% severely burned pro uh, proportion that was due to backburn or was the biscuit fire unusual? Um, I would say that the biscuit fire was somewhat unusual because they were doing, they were basically lighting from the valley bottom there at the 
at the western edge of the Illinois Valley and letting it burn all the way to the ridge top. So Babyfoot Lake is 18 miles from uh, the highway there. And they were burning just a mile or two from the highway up to the ridges. And they were also burning in a lot of cases as a last ditch effort uphill in, in that under, under severe weather conditions. So um, the fire spread was pretty intense in that situation. And the, the ignition techniques were pretty, uh, pretty damaging. And that led to a huge amount of, of area backburned. Um, I would say that currently, um, in, at least in the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains, which is where my experience lies, that fire managers are getting a little bit more wise and a little better at back burning. Um, but there's also a lot of situations where the public is pushing hard for the forest managers to do something to, to, to what I call, I often call that theatrical firefighting. So it's, it's done not to actually contain the fire. Uh, but to appease the public who wants to see something happen. And so, you know, I, I, I would say that here in the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains, fire managers are getting a little bit more savvy, but when pushed and when desperate, um, they still do light high, uh, backburns under, you know, uh, high, like under, under weather conditions that are not conducive to, um, you know, more moderate severity fire. Um, and although high severity fire is not, you know, a bad thing on the landscape. Um, sometimes the, the goal of these fires is to create what they call black line. Um, and that oftentimes can be black line on the forest floor that can reduce fire spread, but a lot of times it's also burning off canopy. And so some, in some situations, and this still certainly happens in fires in the area, um, they are lighting back burns low in, on low slope positions and in extreme weather conditions, and they're exacerbating um, you know, high severity fire patches and eliminating a lot of uh, fire refugia that would exist otherwise within those patches. And in some situations, they're actually going in and burning out what they call green islands to reduce the fuels, you know, burnable fuels um, that remain in patches that did not burn under the natural fire effects. So um, I would say that the trend is getting better um, than it was, say, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but it's still quite problematic and it depends on the fire, the weather, and the, the amount of pressure that fire managers are getting from the public. Hey, just one, one point to underscore Luke's excellent on the ground perspective on this. Uh, this is a real problem. And the problem that I see is that, in, in a, that when a lot of the research looks at whether or not high severity is increasing over a certain time interval, at least since 1984, because we can't go any further back in the data sets uh, that, the, that researchers typically use to monitor fire severity over time. Uh, most of those studies don't report on backburning influence. And so we don't know how much of a confounding factor that is when there are trend analyses that are looking at burn severity over time. It's hard to get that information. You've got to go into incident command reports and you've got to adjust the severity and the burn perimeters to what's a natural factor versus what's been backburned. So while some studies have shown an increase in fire severity over a trend line, uh, they have not uh, factored out the influence of backburning. So what is really being caused by the claims that we've got too much biomass in the forest or too much suppression versus what is actually being triggered by a significant backburning influence that can lead to uh, uncharacteristic uh, high severity factors. I just want to mention too, uh, uh, sort of related to that, on private lands, we also see that salvage logging, I mean, clear cut salvage logging can take place very, very quickly within weeks um, to months um, within a fire. And that can actually also affect how s severity gets classified on a broader landscape scale. Uh, there's a great example, the Moonlight Fire of 2007, there was just massive, massive private clear cut salvage logging that took place before the post fire satellite image was even collected. Um, and we have no idea really whether those areas were truly high severity or whether they were maybe more moderate severity and just most of the trees were removed. We do see a lot of 
green tree removal in post-fire landscapes during salvage logging operations. Um, so that's just, there are so many confounding factors that aren't reported in the literature. And this is something that we as a research group are trying to get at more and more. Okay, thanks. Um, we're getting more and more questions. So we'll answer maybe a couple more because we don't want to keep everybody. Um, so um, someone was asking or you know, mentioned, we're all concerned about the lack of precipitation. Could you talk about how the removal of canopy affects moisture levels and rainfall? I feel maybe Dom, that might be the one for yeah, you. Yeah, I'll do it on a global scale. Then I know Chad's really good at this too. So I'll flip it back over to him. I, another great question. Thank you for that. And you know, on a global level, we see examples of this in forest types in many different settings. Most notably is the Amazon River Basin, which the latest uh, sobering findings is that the Amazon is poised to have a significant tip from being a rainforest to a dry savanna system. And it's that interaction between evapotranspiration that comes from tree canopies to the atmosphere that gives us our hydrological cycle. And when you overcut a region, as in the case of the Amazon basin or many other places on the planet, you actually affect the regional climate in a vicious feedback loop where you've reduced the amount of water going up back up into the atmosphere in that cycle. And then when you do get rain, you don't have the tree cover on the ground to absorb that rainfall and gradually release it throughout the course of the year. So it is definitely a big concern, whether we're talking the Amazon or individual watersheds in the Pacific Northwest, where you could change the whole flow dynamics to streams by overcutting at the watershed or river basin level. You can flush your water through that system rapidly and then lose the evaporate, evapotranspiration that you get from having an intact uh, forest canopy. So I'll flip it over to Chad because I know he's looked at this too. Well, I think that's very, very well said. And I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just add briefly to that, just to say that it's really kind of a double whammy, removing trees from forests. You know, as Dominic said, you know, the, the, the trees, the forests and the trees themselves are, are soaking up enormous amounts of water whenever there's, you know, rainfall. A lot of water that would otherwise, you know, basically make its way back out to the sea, keeping it into the terrestrial landscape and emitting that water into the atmosphere, massive amounts through evapotranspiration that actually influences precipitation patterns um, and, 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 and enhances precipitation patterns. When you remove trees from forests, you undermine that. In addition to undermining that at the local scale, anytime you're removing trees from the forest, you change the microclimate because you're allowing more sunlight to reach the forest floor, you're reducing the cooling shade of the forest canopy cover, and you're allowing everything to dry out more and get hotter and drier um, in, that, in, that, in that, uh, that system whenever you remove trees. Um, and the more trees you remove, the more that happens. And so again, it's really kind of a double whammy in terms of, in terms of creating drier uh, conditions that are less conducive to rain and more conducive to drought. We really need to keep our trees in the forest from a wildlife perspective, from a carbon storage and carbon sequestration perspective to draw down more of that excess atmospheric carbon and mitigate the climate crisis, and also to, uh, to moderate drought, uh, drought patterns. Great, we have time for one more question and this one's in my neighborhood. So I wanted to ask um, Bryant about in Ventura County. This is a question from Eric Williams. In Ventura and Kern counties, certain peaks and ridges like Pine Mountain and Mount Pinos and along the San Emilio have been targeted for thinning. How much more prevalent wind-driven fire behavior, how is the now more prevalent wind-driven fire behavior impacted by thicker or thinner forest densities on these kinds of peaks and ridges during wind-driven fire events? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of complexity there, but I would say ridges, the, the thing about ridges is that they, they often are natural fire breaks. You often see fire stop naturally at ridges or they moderate in intensity. Um, what, what we tend to see is uh, intensity tends to um, increase as a fire is moving up slope. So you will often see intensity naturally increasing as you're going up slope and then it hits a ridge and then it encounters a different air mass it encounters different conditions especially in our neck of the woods down here in the los padres national forest where we actually have east west running mountains um, so we have these really really distinct um, 
differentiations between a south-facing slope and a north-facing slope. If you've ever gone on Pine Mountain, which uh, Eric, uh, Eric Williams brings up here, um, if you stand on top of the ridge and if you were to look to, um, to the south, you would see a very different ecosystem. Uh, you see a lot more chaparral, a lot more open, naturally open forest. Uh, on the north facing slope, you see a lot of, uh, a, lo a lot more forest, uh, denser forest. You see naturally a lot of white fir and other um, species. But the thing is, you can, you can feel the air, <laughs> the air differences. Uh, there's a great spot. There's a little saddle on that mountain where I can just feel this cool air blasting up from the north facing slope. Fires feel that as well. And so as fires are moving, especially from the coastal populated areas, which is often where fires are coming from, um, you know, they're going to naturally stop in those areas uh, anyway. And so when you go in there and you're removing trees and you're, you're further drying out those ridge tops, you may actually be reducing their natural sort of resistance if that's um, a way we could look at it. Uh, so yeah, I, I think this is perhaps something that is underpinning our entire discussion, which is that wind climate these are the, 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 these weather climate conditions are the overriding factors when we're talking about big wildfires, the fires that cause the most amount of acreage burned and often are the ones that cause the most community damage. These are overwhelmingly driven by extreme winds and extremely dry conditions. Those are not things that are fixed by doing more logging and other fuel reduction activities on the landscape. Uh, we are trying to address something that has these really heavy top-down controls by doing this bottom-up approach is simply not is simply not working at this landscape scale uh, and that's why we go back to constantly this concept that we really need to focus on communities work from the home out uh, and, and those are better bottom-up things that we can control in terms of protecting communities. Fire is not this catastrophe out in the landscape. It is not this ecological disaster that I think a lot of people often think it is. It is a disaster in communities, but we can change that. And there are uh, very well-documented um, uh, things that we can do that have been uh, mentioned over and over and demonstrated over and over in the scientific literature uh, to protect communities. So I think I'll leave it at that. Um, maybe some, if anyone else wants to add on to that, but I, I would say that is the um, <laughs> the general thesis of a lot of our of our work here. Any other? Oh, go ahead. So I think that's a good wrap up right there. Yeah, and with that, thanks everyone who stuck with us over our fifteen minute. Um, um limit and so yeah we just want to thank everybody especially the authors uh luke bryant dom and chad um you guys are really paving the way and hopefully we can get this you know narrative out there more and get the policymakers really to focus on you know keeping our forests in the ground and protecting our communities from the ine inevitable fire season um, with that, Rebecca, thank you for moderating with us. Thank you for, for doing this with us, Los Padres Forest Watch. Um, this is our second in the Understanding the Science series. So please look out for um, our next webinar um, sometime next month. I can't believe it's April. Um, and with that, thank you so much, everybody.